Rangers lose two out of three in the Bronx, but partially more concerning. Nathan Eovaldi's fastball velocity is down yet again. Is it time for Rangers fans to be concerned about him and his health? All that and more on this episode of Locked on Rangers. Let's get into it. You are Locked on Rangers. Your daily Texas Rangers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every day. You are locked onto the Texas Rangers. I'm Bryce Paddock, a cripplingly addicted Texas Rangers fan since 2010, the founder and host for all five seasons of this Locked On Rangers podcast. Today is Monday, June 26th, and your Rangers are 47-30, and 30, alone atop the AL West with a five-and-a-half game lead over those pesky Houston Astros. Thank you all so much for making Locked On Rangers your first listen every single day. If you're not already, you can follow me on Twitter at Bryce Paddock. You can follow the show at Locked On Rangers. Subscribe on YouTube, where the best way you can help grow the show is to comment nearly any single thing below. Now, this was a 500 road trip for the Rangers. The Rangers lost two out of three games to the Yankees and one out of three games to the White Sox. And honestly, it it could have been a six game winning streak for the Rangers on this road trip, which road trip, which would have been an eight game winning streak heading back to those two games against the Blue Jays where the Rangers won. But this was a, a lot of frustrating close losses by the Rangers. In, in a series that they absolutely should have won. The bullpen blew yet another game on Sunday, though it wasn't entirely their fault. I felt like this offense should have done a lot more. They got a okay start out of Nathan Eovaldi, even though he was on normal rest, despite having the one off day in this stretch of 30 games in 31 days heading into the All-Star, uh, All-Star break. But the Rangers decided to pitch Nathan Eovaldi on normal four days rest and give Andrew Heaney an extra day off. And I'm just kind of confused as to why we haven't seen Cody Bradford at all in the last two weeks. Now, Nathan Eovaldi's fastball velocity was down in his last start, a a worryingly low, worryingly low, um, where was it? 93.7 miles an hour, which was significantly down to his year average, which was 95.5. And against the Yankees, it was it was down again, 94.4 miles per hour. But he, he said he felt good and, and strong all the way through. He didn't throw 100 pitches in either of those starts, but I'm just kind of a, a little bit confused against the White Sox. He went six innings, four runs, all of which were earned a pair of home runs, which is not typical of Nathan Eovaldi. Uh, he only got four strikeouts in that game against the White Sox and only through 92 pitches and against the Yankees he wasn't able to go through six innings I think he maybe could have faced that one last batter and gotten another out he was at 86 pitches 51 strikes for him in that one a pair of walks for him in both these last two starts and two runs allowed in the Bronx against the Yankees in a game where the Rangers would end up losing but I'm just starting to get a little bit concerned because I think that Nathan Evaldi absolutely should have been given normal rest maybe maybe you still go with with uh, Andrew Heaney against the Yankees, or maybe putting even Cody Bradford in somewhere in this series, because here's how the starters, the Rangers starters look on on normal four days rest in terms of ERA. Nathan Eovaldi, 327. John Gray, 1.57. Andrew Heaney, 2.95. Perez, 3.44. Dane Dunning, 3.00. All those are are pretty good numbers and around the best, but Nathan Evaldi with an one extra day of rest is has a 265 ERA. That's 0.6 lower. John Gray is up at 3.13. Andrew Heaney is up about half a run. Martin Perez is up a run and a half. And Dane Dunning is up 0.38 runs. Um, or 0.38 ERA. And then on six plus days rest, Nathan Eovaldi has been fantastic. A 2.08 ERA. And you cannot say the same about almost anybody else in this Rangers rotation. I mean, Gray's ERA on six days or more of rest, which I guess one of those does include the blow up start against Toronto, where he had basically two weeks off. And so I think that might skew the numbers a little bit. But Gray is at a 392 ERA on six plus days rest. Heaney is at 7.7. Perez is at 5.5. Bain Dunning is at 2.7. So maybe Dunning gets a little bit of extra rest every once in a while. But but still, these guys are, are approaching some pretty heavy workloads. I mean, right now, Nathan Eovaldi is tied for the major league lead in a hunt with an in innings pitch with 105 point one if he continues this pace and doesn't miss any starts and and keeps pitching like this he's he's on pace for 
about 210 innings, which he's never even had 200 innings in his career before. His career high is 199 and two-thirds innings back in Miami in 2014, nearly a decade ago. And he has had um, several several injuries since then but the reason that i, I mentioned nathan evaldi's era dipping or his uh not his era um well that's going up not dipping um but his his pitch velocity going down a little bit is a concerning sign because that that's what happened to him with boston last year i mean the year before in 2021 he was healthy pitched 182 in a third innings you know a 375 era a uh you know 279 FIP was fantastic. 195 strikeouts, finished fourth in Cy Young voting. He was excellent in his first All-Star season. He's probably going to be an All-Star again this year. Um, but last year, only 109 innings, 109 and a third innings in 20 starts, a 387 ERA. And it was significantly worse after the All-Star break. Right around June, his velo- fastball velocity started dipping. He had a couple of starts in June, and then he went on the IL, and he just was not the same after that. In the first half of 2022, he had 13 starts, 72 and two-thirds innings pitched a 334 ERA in the second half only seven starts 36 and two-thirds innings a 491 ERA so I mean the Rangers are being careful and like I said he he only he threw under 90 pitches in this last start and he threw under 100 in the start before that so they have been fairly careful with him and his pitch count he only threw 87 pitches in six shutout innings against Seattle on June 4th and he's only gone over 100 twice in five starts this month once against Tampa Bay 102 pitches for him in that one and then 105 pitches for him against the Angels on June 15th so they've been fairly careful and haven't ramped him up too much he's only gone over 110 innings or 110 pitches in a start twice once in that complete game shutout against the Yankees and once against Oakland in eight and two-thirds innings where he nearly had another complete game shutout the Uh, eight and two-thirds innings of shutout baseball with one walk and 12 strikeouts against Oakland back on May 11th. So they've been fairly careful with him. Even the other complete game that he had against Pittsburgh, the one-run dominant outing in Pittsburgh, only 104 pitches for him in that one. So the Rangers are being careful, and they're definitely monitoring his fastball velocity very closely. I just don't understand why you couldn't just give him one extra day's rest and why you had to flip him and Heaney in the rotation. If you had to do that, fine, but you have Cody Bradford on your roster he hasn't pitched in 13 days 13 days he's just been sitting on the roster taking up a roster spot and not pitching in long relief not pitching you know in any of the extra innings games that the rangers have been in like it's just been confusing why he's still been on this roster if he is not going to start i think he should start i think he has earned that right he has done well in the games where he's started and i know he came in on short rest in that june 13th outing against the angels only went four in third innings but that that was really solid for 64 pitches of work he was really really solid against the angels in that one and the range and he was not the reason why the rangers lost he had another really solid outing against baltimore bouncing back after a tough first inning going five innings gave them five innings against Atlanta even though he got lit up I just don't really understand what the point of having Cody Bradford on the big league roster if he's not starting games and getting experience you know every fifth sixth or once a week at least or at least every 10 days it's been 13 days and Cody Bradford has not seen game action I think that he needs to start on Thursday in this series against Detroit. I mean, there's no listed starter at this point, and that lines up the rotation perfectly for that huge critical series against the Astros. It goes John Gray, then Nathan Eovaldi, then Andrew Heaney, then Martin Perez. I think that is a great way to set up your rotation. I know Martin Perez maybe not be, wouldn't be your favorite to pitch against the Astros, but he always dominates the Astros. He knows how to come up in the big games, and I would feel really good about those four starters in a critical game a critical series against the Houston Astros. And coming up, we're going to look at a little bit of questionable bullpen usage. The Rangers bullpen blew the game on Sunday, but was there a better option for the Rangers to use? We're going to get into that. But first, this word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. 
For a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time around. Just add your ride to my garage and look for the green check to know if the part will fit or your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million different parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Shout out to the Everydayers for making Locked On Rangers your first listen every single day. On Tuesday's show, I'll be talking about why the Rangers need to make a trade, and it's not just to upgrade the bullpen. The Rangers take on the Tigers this week and catch every pitch with the hometown broadcast on Sirius XM. Just download the SXM app and search Rangers. Now, my question after watching that Sunday bullpen explosion is what happened to Brock Burke? It may have been the question on everybody's mind. We have seen very little of Brock Burke in the month of June, and I just want to know why. I feel like the question hasn't been asked very much to Bruce Bochy of of why we haven't seen him in the last month, and I'm just kind of confused. It's been since June 19th that the Rangers have seen Burke. He's only pitched in four games in the month of June, and hasn't thrown a whole lot of pitches in those outings where he's been in there. In June 19th against the White Sox, he got an inning and a third on just 11 pitches. He went one inning against the Angels and allowed a couple of runs, which granted that was off of a Shohei Otani home run, so that happens. 16 pitches for him in that one inning of work on June 15th. Then on June 13th, he also pitched against the Angels two scoreless innings, allowing no hits, just one walk, which was intentional, and got a pair of strikeouts in a huge, huge outing there. Then June 4th against Seattle in a game that was not particularly close, if my memory served correctly, or maybe that was the one um, game that was actually close. I, I'm not thinking so. Um, no, that was the 12-3 to beatdown, so not, not necessarily the highest, actually not any leverage situation for him there. And this would have been a good spot for Brock Burke to come in. The Rangers decided to go with John King. They brought Josh Spores in in the sixth inning to end the threat there. Josh Spores got the strikeout. He got three strikeouts of the four batters that he faced and was exceptional. But if you're, if you're going to use Josh Spores, you got a one-run game. That's a It's a decent outing to go to him. But you've got to get the win. You cannot waste a Josh Spores bullet on a game that you lose. And bringing in John King there in the eighth inning of of a one-run game just was kind of surprising. I know King had had some really good moments before. Maybe they liked the matchup specifically of him being a ground ball pitcher, and they didn't want to go with Burke there in in those situations. I I, I get it, but bringing in Yeri Rodriguez, it just felt like a really, really questionable decision. I mean, King allowed a couple of base runners. Both of them scored when Yeri Rodriguez entered the game, not when John King was there. One of them was a double that was was fairly hard hit, and then one was a just the weakest of weakest hit singles, 75.3 miles an hour off the bat of Jose Trevino, a .080 expected batting average against. Um, Then he got the fly out, and up comes Harrison Bader, with a pair of runners on in this one. And the Rangers decide to go to Yeri Rodriguez? Really? Yeri Rodriguez? Are the Rangers sure about that? Well, they'd already used up their biggest leverage right-hander in Josh Spores. He was done for the day. He threw 23 pitches in this one. So that's that's a fair amount of work. Maybe if you wanted to extend him to go up, get up for a third inning. I know he, he did get up just one inning work. If, if only... If only Nate Ivaldi was going on normal rest or your starter could have gotten you six innings, then you could have thrown Josh Spores for maybe two innings of work, and then he could have gotten you to the ninth inning where you throw in Will Smith. But that's not what happened. And, you know, why would you bring on Yuri Rodriguez to to come in and, and face Harrison Bader? Well, Harrison Bader has been absolutely crushing lefties this year, a 1482 OPS. And I, I know that Brock Burke has reverse splits, and he's better against righties than lefties but John King does not so that was that was about the time where John King was supposed to come out of it if he if King was able to get all the batters that he faced Volpe Trevino and Torres then the Rangers could have gone with uh, I don't know I don't know what they would have. If one guy came on, then you you send him out there to face Yuri Rodriguez, and you know he's also facing against 
off against Giancarlo Stanton, who had been honestly pretty terrible as of late. Since he'd come off the injured list, he was hitting under 100 at one point this weekend. I think heading into this game, he was hitting under 100 in like six or seven games since coming off the I.L. And all the all Yuri Rodriguez did was allow a lot of hard contact. Harrison Bader comes in. He had a... Um, where was it? A 0.597 OPS against righties this year versus, you know, nearly 900 points higher against lefties. So, okay, that matchup doesn't work out. Then you got John Carlos Jan, who's in a really rough way. Bader's double was 101.9 miles an hour off the bat. I believe that scored um, a pair of runs. And then John Carlos Stanton comes up and he hits the crap out of a single 96.6 miles an hour off the bat, a 900 expected batting average on that. And then he gets Jake Bowers who hits the ball the hardest of anybody in that inning, 109.5 miles an hour off the bat, a 750 expected batting average, but he lines it right to a double play, and thankfully the Rangers get out of that inning with just a two-run deficit, but the Rangers couldn't mount much offense in this one. I mean, they, they got three runs. They, they really got to Garrett Cole. They got him out of the game early. They got a big home run from Jonah Heim. They got doubles from Marcus Simeon, from uh, a couple from Ezekiel Duran, one from Leo Tavares, and one from Nathaniel Lowe. All of those except for the second Duran double were off of Garrett Cole. They got to him early. Cole wasn't able to get through five innings even, and the Rangers just weren't able to mount any offense. I mean, the Yankees' bullpen is good, but it, it's it's not that good. It's, it's not that good to keep this Rangers' offense down. I mean, only three runs is just it's just not what you're used to seeing for this team, and, and they did hit three for ten with runners in scoring position, but one of those was a single from Josh Young that was not able to score the run. Just a little bleep over the first baseman, and that got the runner from second to third, and then the Rangers weren't able to do anything with that. Just another frustrating outing for the Rangers, who are really struggling with their clutch offense. It's just been really, really frustrating, but back to Brock Burke, I just I don't know what's going on with him. He had ten appearances in the month of May. He had an ERA over four. He had eight appearances in the month of April, a 180 ERA. I mean, I, he's one of your best leverage relievers on the year. I mean, I know his numbers aren't quite as insane as last year. The walk rate is significantly down, 4.3% walk rate, which is in the top 4% of baseball. Last year, his strikeout rate was at 27.4%. This year, down to under 20%, which is in the bottom, uh, around the bottom quarter of baseball, the 27th percentile, not getting a lot of swings and misses. But he is getting, you know, a good chase rate, a good. Fastball velocity, expected ERA is, is all in, in nice places, his actual ERA is in, in all nice places. I just don't know why he's not being used more frequently. I, I get that Yuri Rodriguez was your option there because you only had so many righties in your pen. Grant Anderson just worked two innings the night before and in a game where the Rangers probably should have won that one as well, and the offense literally couldn't do anything in that game on Saturday, which was incredibly frustrating. Um, but still, it, it's just kind of confusing why why the Rangers aren't using two of their guys. They're basically just letting two guys sit in the pen and not be used barely at all, and Brock Burke and Cody Bradford. I don't know what the plan is for Bradford. If he's not starting on Thursday, then, then he shouldn't be on this Major League roster. He should be starting games in AAA, and you, you call up somebody somebody on the 40-man roster to to just be able to pitch I mean there aren't a whole lot of options right now in the minor leagues that could come up and and give you some outings Cole Reagans is working on being stretched out as a starter Owen White maybe if, if you really want to sacrifice him starting every day which by the way congrats to Owen White who was named to the futures roster um who, congratulations, I think that's the first time that he has been named to the MLB Futures Games. That's going to be on Sunday before the All-Star break. Great moment for him. Made his Major League debut, is in AAA right now, and uh, I'm, I'm excited for him. It's a, a really great moment for him, but this is a rough outing for Yuri Rodriguez. I don't know how much the Rangers can trust him in clutch leverage situations. Having Jose LeClerc on the 15-day IL, he was placed on the 15-day IL this weekend after twisting his ankle, shagging fly balls. That's a real freak injury. Bad luck for the Rangers and and kind of frustrating. But coming up, we're going to look at a few more options on the Rangers 40-man roster and a, a little bit more um, at this clutch offense, not clutching. A, a nice, nice Friday night win for the Texas Rangers. But first, this word from our sponsors.
Shout out to the Everydayers for making Locked On Raiders your first listen every single day. On Thursday's show, I'll have a crossover with Lindsey Crosby of Locked On Elite Prospects to talk about the draft and some Rangers prospects on the year. The Rangers take on the Tigers this week and catch every pitch with the hometown broadcast on Sirius XM. Just download the SXM app and search Rangers. Now, this clutch offense has been incredible so far this year for the Rangers. It's been one of the reasons why Texas has the best offense in all of baseball, and the depth of this lineup has been absolutely incredible. But it's just been random times where things have just you know numbers have have just kind of come back down to earth in really extreme ways and and one of the ways was on Saturday where the Rangers just couldn't get anything going offensively against Luis Severino of all people wasn't he at like he had some incredible stuff his ERA on the season even after five or six shutout innings I should say is still over five I mean the Rangers weren't able to get into the pen at all and despite a good start from John Gray who only allowed one run on a solo shot yet again John Gray allowed just one run on a solo shot and was tagged with the loss in a one nothing defeat. Now, this Rangers lineup on Saturday was much better than the lineup that the Rangers trotted out there in that series finale against the Cardinals, where they lost one nothing. But but still, it was it was enough to get things done. And and it wasn't just it wasn't just Luis Severino that that shut down the Rangers offense. I mean, Clark Schmidt was was fantastic. His ERA is is 4.32 on the season. He's not been anything near spectacular. And it took the Rangers I mean, 10 innings to score four runs against the Yankees on Friday night. And they, they did do it in spectacular fashion. Got a pair of runs, one in the fourth, one in the eighth, one from a clutch hit from Mitch Garver. Good to see him coming up in a big situation. And, and uh, you know, part of the only reason they scored that, that fourth inning run was was some goops by um, Isaiah kiner Falefa Had a, a really rough day on Friday. Honestly, a really, really tough day. I went back and, and watch the game. I was out um, watching a friend perform at the House of Blues. So it was one of the few games I haven't watched live this season, but going back and seeing it, this is this is an awful game for Isaiah kiner Falefa in center field. A bloop single by Leody Tavares. It, it scores Ezekiel Duran. Duran made it to first base on using his speed, a, a really great play by the third baseman to get to the ball, but Duran was just too fast, and with two outs, Leo Tavares blooped the ball into shallow center field. Isaiah kiner Falefa was coming on. He took his eye off it for a second, and he thought that Anthony Volpe was going to be able to catch it, but it, it ended up dropping in front of him for a base hit, and Duran was off to the races because he was two outs, and he was a smart base runner and making some aggressive base running decisions. And and as it kind of flip, it just overruns the ball, it just completely overruns the ball in the top of the fourth inning, and that allows Leoti to get to second base, and it allows Zeke Duran to score the tying run. And then later on in the game, I believe it was the fifth inning, Isaiah kind of flip a singled off the glove of Josh. Young and then stole second base, but thought that he was called out. So he got off the base and started walking back to, to the dugout and Marcus Simeon just tagged him out. And that was a critical moment for the Yankees. And it really, in a game that was 1-1 at that point, was was a huge play for the Rangers and a huge break for the Rangers. Good to see them. if They're, they're losing these games lately and it's been frustrating, but at least they're not losing games in that fashion. That would be just honestly... Uh, un- unheard of t- and just make you want to rip your hair out and, and scream into the sun but th- this was a really solid game for the Rangers overall I know the offense wasn't able to get much going until late and it came off the bat of who else but Adolis Garcia of course he comes up clutch with a 10th inning home run a go-ahead home run his 17th of the season came off of John King who's been a really really good reliever for the Rangers this year or for the Yankees this year but Adolis Garcia didn't care one pitch one bomb, two runs, enough to get the Rangers the win, a 4-2 to two win, and you know, solid pitching all around for the Rangers in this one. Dane Dunning, I was a little worried watching him work early. A couple of, uh, I think it was actually three straight innings where he walked, either walked or hit the leadoff batter to get them on base, but he went seven innings, just two runs on 87 pitches. That is, that is really impressive stuff. Then John King comes in um, in the eighth inning. It was a couple of runs that were both charged to Dane Dunning and um, really he was only pitching for one of them. He was only pitching in the second inning where he allowed that run but John King came in and wasn't able to limit the damage. Did have a couple of base runners runners on the corners with no outs in the eighth inning. Could we have seen a little bit more from Dane Dunning? Yeah, probably but you know it happens. It happens to the best of them. And King came up in a good enough situation and, and 
did his best, did a shutout inning of work, didn't allow a single hit or walk, so just the sack fly that uh, drove in the run. Then Joe Barlow comes in, gets a scoreless inning, and Will Smith comes in for the save, his 14th of the season to get the Rangers the only win in this series in the Bronx. Just a frustrating series where the Rangers could very easily be riding an eight-game winning streak heading into this series against the Tigers, who are just not a very good baseball team, and they're without their best position player and their best pitcher, who went on the IL during that series against the Rangers. So just just kind of frustrating to see the Rangers not coming up big when they needed to and could be extending this lead in the division. They have the biggest lead in the division among AL teams, a five and a half game lead. Tampa has a four and a half game lead over Baltimore, who has a half game lead over the Rangers for the second best record in the AL and the Braves have a six game lead over the Miami Marlins in the a- the NL East so the Rangers don't have the biggest biggest record or the biggest um I don't know, lead in their division they're five and five in the last 10 and they've gained ground on the Astros they've gained two games on the Astros and one game on the Angels Houston is three and seven in their last 10 and I really wish they would have been um two and eight after a Sunday night game where they were able to rally and and get a win over those Dodgers. But um, yeah, the Rangers are in a solid place and it's frustrating seeing them lose these games. And yeah, they're learning how to win close games and it's frustrating, but at least they're not gaining ground or they're not losing ground. But still, you look at the other side of the coin and you think, well, this is where you should be gaining ground. The Rangers have a healthy team. They have all of their starting pitchers. Again, sends Jacob DeGrom healthy. I mean, all of their starting hitters are are hitting and, and doing well. I mean, we've seen a little bit of a slump from Marcus Simeon. His OPS is down all the way to 792. And if you were going to guess who has the highest OPS on the Rangers among players who are qualified, um, if you guessed Leo Tavares, you would be right. And also probably confused um, if you saw that at the beginning of the season. That, wait, Leo Tavares is the Rangers' best hitter of qualified hitters in June 26th? That doesn't make any sense, but you know, Lily Tavares' breakout this year has been exceptional and much, much needed for the Rangers. I said on Sunday in that loss that Lily Tavares is going to be a guy who makes multiple all-star teams by the time it's all said and done. And I stand by it, even though he got immediately picked off and he got caught flat-footed a little bit and, and slipped on his way back to first base and back picked by Jose Trevino. He did end up getting him back and getting his eighth stolen base of the season. And I'm glad to see Lily Tavares being aggressive on the base pass and having a little bit more success than he had in years past. He's also doing it with his power. He's got six home runs in the month of June, which lead the Rangers. He's got an 827 OPS, and the only guys on the team that are ahead of him in terms of OPS are, well, Corey Seager at 1,028, which is down from the 1,000 and I think 70 it was heading into this series. Not the best series from Corey Seager, but again, it's Corey Seager. He's still got an OPS north of 1,000 and hitting 349. It's pretty hard to criticize what he's been doing. Simeon being in a little bit of a slump as of late has been kind of frustrating. Lowe has been picking it up and, and so has Jonah Heim. His OPS is up to 814. And I believe last I checked, he has a, a more home runs than than the other guy who is, is going to be competing for votes to be the starting catcher in the American League for the All-Star game in Adley Rutschman. Let me go double check that really quick. No, uh, yes, 11 home runs for Jonah Heim and just 10 for Adley Rutschman and also a significantly higher fan graphs war for Jonah Heim than Adley Rutschman and, and even a higher baseball reference war for Jonah Heim than Adley Rutschman. Go out there and get your votes in for the five Rangers finalists. There's Jonah Heim, there's Marcus Simeon, Corey Seager, Josh Young, and Adolis Garcia. All of them are worthy to be all-star starters. All of them are deserving and in need of your votes, so go get out there. The first round doesn't count towards these votes, so tallies start anew. So go out there, vote these Rangers to the All-Star game, and maybe them, and uh, even though I'm hoping that Nathan Yavali doesn't pitch in the All-Star game if he's selected, maybe the Rangers can have six, maybe even seven All-Stars in this game, because this is a talented, deep team. It's been a little bit of a rough swoon in June, but four games against the Detroit Tigers at home heading into that series against the Astros is exactly what the doctor ordered. Hopefully the Rangers can take care of business and get back to their winning ways and make July just as good of a month as the month of May was for these Texas Rangers. That's going to do it for today's show. Thank you all so much for listening and subscribing. And until next time, don't forget to enjoy first place Texas Rangers baseball.